Welcome to Business Connect Offshore Wind, Solar and Energy Storage in Taiwan, presented by the Taiwan External Trade Development Council, TITRA. Founded in 1970, TITRA is Taiwan's foremost non-profit trade promoting organization. Sponsored by the government and industry organizations, TITRA assists enterprise to expand their global reach. Today, we will have experts from the Taiwan Institute of Economic Research, Sustainable Energy Association of Singapore, and an industry panel discussion convening industry CEOs across the solar, wind, and energy storage sectors. To start off, let us welcome Ms. Amelia C, Executive Director of Exhibition Department, TITRA, for the event's opening remarks. Over to you, Ms. Amelia. everyone, on behalf of the organizer TITRA, a leading trade promotion agency in Taiwan, supported by Ministry of Economic Affairs, I'm delighted to welcome all of you to watch the Taiwan Business and Trade Show webinar, focusing on renewable energy industry in Taiwan. The global industries and our lifestyles have been disrupted dramatically since the outbreak of COVID-19 in 2020. If we ask ourselves what impact the pandemic has brought to us, undoubtedly, we pay more attention to the issues of sustainability and ESG. To protect the earth in which we live, the human beings have been taking a lot of climate actions by reducing carbon emissions and initiating the concept of net zero to cut the greenhouse gas emissions to as close to zero as possible. To keep global warming to no more than 1.5 degrees Celsius, as called for in Paris Agreement, emissions need to be reduced by 45% by 2030 and reach net zero by 2050. A growing coalition of countries, cities, business, and other institutions are pledging to get to net zero emissions. To respond to the global climate actions, the efforts of Taiwan government to increase the sustainability of energy systems keep on going, with renewable energy targeted at 20% and coal use reduced from 45% in 2016 to 30% of its energy generation by 2025. Between 2021 and 2025, Taiwan will add 5.7 gigawatts of already allocated offshore wind power to the grid. An additional 10 gigawatts of offshore wind power will be added to the grid between 2026 and 2035. For solar energy, Taiwan will add 14.2 gigabytes by 2025. The current unfinished wind and solar projects value approximately 82.9 billion US dollars, among the highest investment in Asia region. In this webinar, we have invited industrial experts, both from Taiwan and Singapore, to share their insights on the latest trends of renewable energy sectors. To connect you with business partners in Taiwan, attending related trade shows must be the best platforms. So, in this webinar, my colleague Carol will also give you a snapshot on the following trade shows. Energy Taiwan, Wind Energy Asia, Taiwan International Water Week, and Sustainable Taiwan Expo. I hope you enjoy this webinar. Thank you again for watching. Thank you, Ms. Amelia C. Now let us welcome Dr. Meg J. C. Lin, a PhD Deputy Director of Research Division 1, Taiwan Institute of Economic Research, and also the CEO of Taiwan Hydrogen and Fuel Cell Partnership. She will share with us on current status and future trends of hydrogen and energy storage development in Taiwan. Over to you, Dr. Lin. Hi. Hi, uh, I'm Meg. 
Uh, so uh, we can, I can start to uh, presentation now. Uh, hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Then your slides is showing. Please go ahead. <laughs> Okay, okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Meg Ling um, from uh, Taiwan Institute of Economic Research and also representative of the Taiwan Hydrogen and the Fuel Cell Partnership. And my presentation uh, topic is about the uh, uh, current status and the future trends of hydrogen and the energy storage development industry in Taiwan. Okay, next page. Okay. Uh, this is my outline. Uh, I will pre uh, present about uh, Taiwan uh, renewable energy and the zero emission policy in the future, and also about the uh, Taiwan energy storage and uh, hydrogen industry development. Okay, next page. Okay, the first one is about global emission policy and uh, international indicators. Okay. Next page. Okay, so uh, because of the G20 and the COP26 last year, so uh, now the global emission policy and the international indicators, it is about a lot of the zero emission and the renewable energy. Um, so for, for so the Europe and the US and the, the South Korea and the, also the global, lots of the country, we can see that they have a lot of the green energy in in. Um, industry development policy and the, the zero emission policy. And uh, so uh, so in the Taiwan is also have the uh, net zero emission by 2050. Okay, next page. Okay, so uh, we also sort out the global emission policy and the international indicators. So we see some uh, institute from the UNIDO, OECD, or the Green Growth Index, and also lots of the industry from Taiwan uh, are announced to join the renewable energy 100% or the energy productivity 100%, and also the electric vehicle 100%. Uh, so uh, in Taiwan and the global and we uh, a lot of the industry they are focused on the the trades and uh, uh, for their products so if they want to export their products to other country they need to do the uh, renewable energy 100 percent or, or they will be charged lots of the uh, carbon emission fee okay next page And about Taiwan, what's our action about the zero emission uh, policy? And I will introduce the, uh, the next page. Okay, in Taiwan, um, we also, uh, our president, uh, Dr. Tsai, also announced the 2015 net zero emissions. And it's uh, just uh, announced uh, in the March this year. So uh, in Taiwan, uh, lots of the, uh, the different uh, parts of the government and the, the central government and the local government, they, also, they already uh, prepare to do the technology development and uh, to have the industry or the household person and to use the uh, lots of different technology or renewable energy uh, products in their household or factory to help them to, to reach the zero emission goal in the future. And also in Taiwan, in the past, we also have the Greenhouse Gas Reduction and the Management Act. So uh, the global target 2050 about the zero emission in Taiwan is also we do the lots of the policy and the in, in, and uh, subsidize to help the industry to reach the goal. And uh, also we, we have another uh, policy is about uh, 20, 2025, we will have the 20% about the green energy uh, generation. And uh, uh, also we have the green finance action plan for the industry too. Okay, next page. And uh, let me introduce some uh, uh, big company in Taiwan. For example, the TSMC is very famous, and the Delta, Asus, and uh, some uh, 
uh, some uh, about the uh, uh, industry, they already announced that they will join the renewable energy. For example, TM TSMC, they announced uh, and joined the uh, renewable uh, energy 100% in 2020. And 2050, they will get a net zero emission. And the Delta company, they also joined the uh, uh, renewable energy 100% uh, to announce that they will use the total 100% uh, renewable energy electricity to do their uh, process and uh, to uh, produce uh, their products. And uh, the 2030, they will have the 100% renewable energy and uh, they will reducing carbon intensity by uh, all, all more than 55% by 2025. Okay. So uh, also some companies, maybe they are not so big, but uh, they will get gathering together and help each other to invest or to try to use the renewable energy, for example, the hydrogen or the energy storage and also the solar power and the wind power to help themselves to reach the renewable energy 100% and also they can, get the re uh, can reach the zero emission goal in the future. Okay, next page. So uh, let's talk about the Taiwan energy storage and hydrogen industry development right now. Okay, next page. Okay, so uh, in fact, in Taiwan, the hydrogen and the fuel cell industry already development more than uh, 20 years. And also I work in this field and the research more than 10 years. So uh, I learned a lot from the, our Taiwan hydrogen and the fuel cell industry people. And we have already more than 50 companies, they, are, they invest or develop the hydrogen and the fuel cell technology many, many years. And already they already co-work with the global companies uh, with the other country. And also these years, I think maybe it's uh, past the 10 years, the energy storage systems became more and more important for Taiwan uh, because uh, we already have a solar power and a wind power and we need to help our the grid to be more stable. So uh, we started to use the energy storage system. So uh, in the so this is a two association about the industry. The first one is the Taiwan Energy Storage System Industry Promotion Alliance. And another one is Taiwan Hydrogen and the Fuel Cell Partnership. And the, this two association, they already have the more than, I think more than uh, hundreds of the companies from Taiwan and the, they have each other and uh, gives the suggestions to our government to about the policy and the uh, uh, industry technology subsidy uh, suggestions. Okay, next page. Okay, so uh, you use the energy storage market, we have to, to stable the grid and help the uh, industry to regulation the electricity and to stable the renewable energy too. Okay, next page. And this is the supply chain about the Taiwan energy and the storage uh, supply chain. So you can see the battery, the PCS, and the EMS, and the control system, the software, and the hardware is very completely uh, from Taiwan. So you can see lots of the companies' names here. So uh, is in Taiwan, we can almost do all the systems by our, um, ourselves to have the industry to use it and. Uh, also, we can export or develop the uh, energy storage technology we can work with other country. Okay, next page. And also, this is a supply chain in Taiwan hydrogen and the fuel cell industry. You can see the raw materials and the, the uh, fuel cell stack and the system application in the stationary application, transportation, uh, transportation application, and also the, uh, the uh, system, uh, other components, key components, or the hydrogen generation or purifying the uh, industry. We have lots of company 
in Taiwan. So uh, also, it's very completely the supply chain from Taiwan, and we already co-work with uh, lots of the country. Um, so I think if maybe in the future we can co-work with the Singapore. But uh, uh, actually, I, I I know some company already co-work with Singapore now. Okay, next page. And uh, this is the uh, fuel cell demonstration site in Taiwan. Okay, you can see this is a Taiwan island, and we also have the more than 20 sites, 200 systems uh, installation in Taiwan. This is a fuel cell and a hydrogen uh, use. Okay, next page. And uh, the some, uh, we co work with some uh, local government to do the uh, smart uh, city, smart communities. So we have the uh, resident, local resident to experience the renewable energy and uh, to use the energy storage and uh, combined with the fuel cell to be their UPS of their uh, buildings. And we also have a very big monitor in the first floor. So every resident just uh, they, when they go outside and uh, they can see how much green energy we have and uh, how much money we already save because of the green energy and the carbon emission, how much is also too. Okay, next page. Okay, and uh, this is in Taiwan, Kaohsiung, and uh, this is a very big energy storage case and uh, to helping the uh, energy, uh, the solar energy systems. Okay, next page. And uh, this is another system and also to help the solar power in uh, Taichung in Taiwan, the mid middle of the Taiwan. Okay, next page. And uh, this is very special that we have some companies co work with the CPC company. They are the gas station. Okay, so they have the Taiwan, the, we have the more than 2,000 gas station now. So uh, all the gas station, maybe in the future, they cannot use the gas line. So they can transform this uh, gas station to become the uh, so it's EV charger or to renewable energy or to do that. A hydrogen gas station to becoming a more green and a smart green stations right now. So now uh, the CPC company they are trying to 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 transformation right now. Okay, next page. And uh, this is uh, some backup power cases in Taiwan hydrogen and a fuel cell project. So uh, we use uh, in the uh, railway bureau and the backup power of the roller, the signal lights, or the uh, telecom backup power. So uh, to have some some place that maybe they will lock up the electricity when the typhoon or earthquake come. So they use the hydrogen and the fuel cell to become their very clean energy about the backup power. Okay, next page. And uh, there's some cases from uh, Taiwan, the offshore areas, some little islands near Taiwan, the Green Island or the Penghu Islands. They use the uh, energy storage and the fuel cell to uh, to combine with the renewable energy. And also they can very isolate in the island and supply the clean energy for the resident in the island. Okay, next page. So this is some uh, smart city usage in Taichung, Taipei, and the new Taipei city in Taiwan. Okay, next page. And uh, also we have some transport application in Taiwan, the boat in some lake and uh, the drones and the uh, scooters. And also now we have some company to develop the uh, fuel cell bus. Okay, next page. And uh, also uh, in Taiwan, we are very uh, well known that we have a semiconductor uh, science park in Taiwan. And uh, so some uh, science park semiconductor industry from their procedure, we will get a lot of the waste uh, hydrogen from their uh, factory. So now we have some technology to purifying or to reuse to reuse the uh, uh, waste of gas, waste of hydrogen to put into the procedure again, or to use the waste of uh, hydrogen to get the electricity uh, with the uh, fuel cell. So this is some company, they have this uh, tech technology or they will be the users. Okay, next page. 
And uh, so uh, this is a green hydrogen application in Taiwan. The early key company already invested in Taiwan to have the low carbon hydrogen production factory and to supply the uh, green hydrogen to the TSMC. Um, so uh, I think in the future, we will have more and more uh, green hydrogen uh, trend uh, in the future. Okay, next page. And also, so Taiwan has a very mature and a complete fuel cell industry supply chain. And we already co-work with the Boone Energy is a, a fuel cell SOFC company in America. And so we supply, four companies supply the more than 60% key components to the Boone Energy company. So uh, this is a very successful case uh, from Taiwan. And uh, we, also, we also can supply the affordable and uh, good quality uh, key components about the hydrogen fuel cell and the energy storage systems to other countries. Okay, next page. So uh, the, my conclusions, I think uh, Taiwan is uh, in Asia and uh, we already developed the hydrogen and the energy storage industry uh, more than 20 years. So uh, we are very happy to co-work with our other country and uh, to reach the uh, zero emission goal. So uh, I hope in the future we also can co-work with Singapore too and uh, to, uh, to, to co-work together and uh, to help the, each other's uh, policy and the market and the users to use the more green and clean energy in the future. Okay, thank you for everyone. Uh, this is my presentation today. And uh, if you have any questions, this is my email address and my LinkedIn, and uh, you can also feel free to uh, contact with me. Thank you. Thank you very much to Dr. Lin for your insightful presentation. Next up, let us welcome Mr. Christoph Inglin, Deputy Chairman, Clean Energy Committee Chair, uh, Sustainable Energy Association of Singapore, uh, CIS for short, who will share his perspective on Singapore and Taiwan collaboration opportunities for clean energy sector. So, uh, Christoph, uh, please uh, join us and uh, over to you. Hello, Christoph. Can you turn on your video? Hello everyone, uh, um, Christoph has a little technical difficulty, but he will start his presentation very soon, so please hang on. Okay, um, is it now all clear? Yes. Okay, great. I'm so sorry about that. I'm not sure what happened. It switched off, switched on again. So uh, presenting now. Chelsea? 
Yes, please go ahead, Christoph. Okay, so good morning, everybody. Apologies for that glitch. So my name is Christoph England. Uh, Chelsea's already introduced me. I'd like to go through um, four key points. First, an introduction to Singapore and the renewable energy capabilities that um, we've acquired under the constraints dictated by our geography. Then um, look at basically our focus on PV, a brief introduction to SEAS, the Sustainable Energy Association of Singapore, and then finish with what it is, I think, uh, the scope we have between Singapore and Taiwan for uh, collaboration. So we have a small city state, limited alternative energy potential, only just over 700 square kilometers of land, no hydro, no geothermal energy resources, not much wind. The wind is very gradual here, only about two meters per second. So we don't have typhoons and uh, we have sunshine, but we never have a clear blue sky all day. So it's variable and intermittent. Those are the constraints. On the other hand, uh, Singapore is also a regional center and clean tech hub for research and financing. Within a seven hour flight radius, access to 2.8 billion people, so about 40% of the world's population. Very robust R&D and IP generation, and a living lab to tropicalize. So what we have in contrast with, let's say, Germany, Japan, United States, and Australia, is the equatorial climate, which is quite different. Uh, next slide, please. So already a long time ago, we started transforming our energy or electricity sector um, back in 1990. Uh, over 95% of our electricity came from burning fossil fuel uh, in the form of oil, um, quite heavy sulfur fuel oil, which um, emits about 750 grams per kilowatt hour of um, CO2 per kilowatt hour. And now, as from 2014, over 95% comes from natural gas. So that has almost halved our emissions per kilowatt hour. Where to go from here? Uh, we don't have nuclear. Uh, so basically, it is renewable energy, which we need to tap. Next slide, please. And here you see our progress in uh, the only really available renewable energy to us currently, which is solar photovoltaics. Starting back in 2009, very small progress because a few grants only, but fundamentally the Singapore government has avoided uh, distorting the electricity market with subsidies. So we had to wait basically for the cost to come down to the point where it could take off without much of the way of subsidies. That started in 2014 as the cost fell and we had some government programs to encourage installations on government buildings, the Solar Nova program, um, it, it took off. Then we were suddenly faced with a uh, headwind, very low electricity tariffs caused by excess competition. Very hard to compete when PV was just about at grid parity and suddenly electricity prices dropped to the extent that wholesale generators were losing money. In 2018, costs had fallen even, even further and PV was a convincing um, substitute, uh, an alter economically viable alternative, growing very nicely. We had the two year hiccup due to COVID and we're now on a run rate of something like 200 megawatts per year. So what on our way to hitting the target of 1.5 gigawatts by 2025, and then two gigawatts peak by 2030. Some of you may be seeing, oh, okay, a lot of this is private sector is one thing. So we've taken over from the public agencies and what happens when we saturate? So I'll get to that towards the end because um, if we're going at 200 megawatts per year now, then we'll very soon hit that, uh, that saturation point. Next slide, please. This illustrates the kind of thing we specialize in. Um, so looking at every rooftop is an opportunity and the large ones, of course, are commercial and industrial. So metal rooftops, concrete rooftops, and um, uh, also car parks, um, you name it. As long as the roof faces the sun, which most of them do, it's a good opportunity for, for PV. Next slide, please. We don't have much in the way of residential. Being a, uh, a tight city, most of the population is in high-rise buildings, but the landed residential buildings that you see here, houses tend to have quite big systems. The average system size on a residential uh, building is about 25 kilowatts. The examples you see here are rather on the larger side. Uh, next slide, please. So here we have um, some of the things which are fairly unique. 
Uh, and um, on the top right, I'd like to highlight a solar farm. Well, we've seen solar farms all over the world. What's different about this one is two things. One, integrated rainwater harvesting. So as a small island without mountains and without glaciers to melt, we depend on either imported uh, fresh water from Malaysia, and more and more, uh, we're depending on our own rainwater plus on desalination. Desalination is energy intensive and expensive. So if we can harvest rainwater without wasting it, so much the better. So the top right is a dual use field. The second thing is something which plagued us for a long time, large areas of land reserved for industry and the government not yet knowing whether those pieces of land would lie empty for 20 years in case perhaps a company would come along and need them to build an industry on. So we've developed a program where these PV sites can on short notice be moved in case the land is required for an industrial site and they can be moved to a new one. So they're no longer put in with the assumption that they'll last for 25 years in that location. So quick moving. At the bottom, we have expensive labor. Um, so we're looking at means of reducing the labor costs for cleaning, so with robots. Bottom left, you see one of the world's largest um, freshwater floating PV plant, 60 megawatts. And uh, there's more planned, several hundred megawatts are planned on our reservoirs, with the added benefit, of course, of reducing the evaporative losses of this precious drinking water. And top left is something you don't see much yet around the world, which is marine floating uh, PV. Many challenges faced there, and we're learning about them from marine fouling and, of course, um, the corrosion due to the saline water. This is in a quiet area between Singapore and Malaysia, so not yet wide open sea, but we intend to expand that and see how that can coexist with shipping lanes. Next slide, please. So, brief introduction to SEAS, the Sustainable Energy Association um, of Singapore. So our mission is to be the voice of the sustainable and clean tech industry. We're a non-profit association promoting the energy efficiency and renewable energy to grow the industry. 200 over corporate members uh, spanning all kinds of technologies and sectors. Then we have lots of committees and working groups focusing on clean energy, energy efficiency, finance, sustainable infrastructure, carbon, marine renewables, sustainable energy startup network, energy storage, and now, of course, energy mobility, uh, electric mobility, so EVs and hydrogen. Contrary to many industry associations, we're financed not so much from membership or from the government, but largely by training. So this is where we focus on uh, training the industry using industry professionals. So it's less academic and more practice oriented. And I think it gives a very valuable enhancement to the kind of academic training you can get in the institutes of higher learning. It gives a great opportunity as well for uh, industry members to enhance their networking and their presentation um, abilities. Next slide, please. This is our flagship event. Uh, so we heard from Dr. Meg Lin uh, that in Taiwan, you have many uh, events throughout the year. In the clean tech sector, we have this one major event uh, co-organized together with uh, the Energy Market uh, Authority of Singapore, so ACES. Um, it takes three days. It's taking place this year in October. And the photos you see from last year, everybody wearing the mask, we're promised that this year should be a much more real event, less virtual, um, and uh, hopefully with masks off. We encourage you to come over and meet us here in Singapore. It'll be a great place for, for networking and to concoct plans for the energy industry. Now the uh, final slide, please. So wide scope for Singapore-Taiwan collaboration. Uh, I was very impressed with the uh, capabilities that uh, Dr. Meg Lin presented, especially on hydrogen and energy storage, which we're just coming up to. Now, one of my early slides, I mentioned we are going to rapidly approach our target of 1.5 and then 2 gigawatts of, uh, of PV in Singapore before we run out of space. And that won't make a big dent. It will still only supply maybe 5% of our electricity. So the Energy Market Authority is aiming to source about 30% of our electricity by 2035 in the form of four gigawatts of 24-7, so continuous low carbon power. If you would achieve this with solar PV, you're going to need something like over 32 gigawatts of solar PV capacity. And this will go in primarily likely in Indonesia, plus significant battery storage. So that PV power can be, or the energy can be um, delivered on a 24-7 on-demand basis. 
So gigawatt scale solar farms, floating PV and energy storage systems. I think that's something where we can share Taiwan's know-how. And the power imports via HV uh, DC subsea cables. So um, we're going well beyond just talking about silicon technology. This is whole systems engineering. We're going to require international partnerships, engineering expertise, financing. None of this happens without money. And remember, it's not happening with subsidies. This is going to happen uh, based on commercial viability alone. So uh, that brings me to the, to the end. I would just like the very final closing slide, please. Please keep in touch with us. You can contact me directly. My email is there. And if you scan the, uh, the, the QR code, then you can contact C's and find out uh, who our members are and do a bit of research, maybe some companies you'd like to meet and visit. Let me take this opportunity to thank uh, DMG and also Titra for inviting us to present uh, Singapore's capabilities. Thanks very much and have a great workshop. Bye-bye. Thank you very much, Christoph. Now let us welcome Mr. Hendrik Bone, Energy and Infrastructure uh, of Asia Pacific, also the Head of Business Development and Asset Management of Aquila Capital, who along with industry CEOs today will delve into navigating the landscape and seizing the market opportunities in Taiwan's renewable sector. Uh, so Hendrik, please join us and over to you. Yes, thank you very much for the introduction, Chelsea. Um, as mentioned, my name is Henrik Bohne. I work for a company called Aquila Capital. We've been around for the last 20 years, focusing on energy and infrastructure, as well as other real asset development and investment. Um, we opened our office in Taiwan about two years ago, focusing there on, on renewable energy investments, um, primarily in the solar PV space but across the APEC region, looking also at wind opportunities, battery storage, be it standalone or, or co-located. And I'm uh, joined today by a very esteemed panel of industry experts from Taiwan. Um, I will ask each of them now to introduce themselves. Um, maybe we can start with Marina from Copenhagen Infrastructure. Marina, please. Yes. Thank you very much, Hendrik and everybody. My name is Marina Su. I am the managing director of Copenhagen Infrastructure Service Company. We manage all the assets here in Taiwan owned by the funds that CIP, Copenhagen Infrastructure Partners, are managing on. And uh, currently, we have two offshore wind farms that are under construction. One is called Zhangfang Xida Project, and the other one is called Zhongnen Project. All together, they total 900 megawatt. That means they are able to provide clean energy to approximately 1 million households in Taiwan. And uh, it's a great pleasure to be able to, and a great honor as well, to be able to be in this panel together with all the excellent panelists and with yourself, Hendrik. So I very much look forward to our discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Marina. Uh, ben from URE, can I ask you please to do a brief introduction of yourself? Okay, uh, thank you very much, Hendrik. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Ben Pan, and I am Vice President of Business Group here at uh, URE, which stands for United Renewable Energy. Uh, we are, uh, you are uh, here at URE, we are the largest uh, manufacturer of uh, PV, PV solar panels as well as PV systems in Taiwan. Uh, our annual business uh, is roughly 2.5 gigawatts globally, of which this year we will uh, install 850 megawatts of solar panels and PV systems uh, in Taiwan. And uh, here at URE, we also uh, uh, heavily invest in the uh, energy storage as well. And uh, we are working to integrate our energy storage together with our uh, PV knowledge. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. Achal, can I pass over to you, please? Yeah, um, th thank you, Hendrik. Uh, so my name is Achal Sondi. I'm, I'm the VP of Growth for APAC at Fluence. Fluence is a technology company uh, in the energy storage space. Um, we currently are about 140 people in the region. Uh, and and in, more recently in Taiwan, we've been very active in the, the market with some storage projects that many developers are looking to do and supporting them in those storage projects, including Thai Power itself. 
uh, and and we see a lot of opportunity in Taiwan given the unique nature of the island and the the ambitions that the country has and and we applaud it because of the leadership it's taking so um very excited for this panel thanks for the opportunity and looking forward to it thank you Ashram. and last but not least we have also dr chang online from gus technology hello uh, good morning everyone i'm really sorry to say that uh Dr. Chang wouldn't be able to make it because of uh, the time constraint, so I'll be filling up for him. I'm Dr. Prem. I'm working in the R&D of uh, Gus Technologies. Gus Technologies is, uh, is a battery manufacturing company that's uh, situated in the northern part of Taiwan. Here we uh, uh, produce both uh, pouch cells for both EVs and uh, ESS. We started in uh, around like four years ago. Right now we have a production capacity of around zero point. Uh, to gigawatt and in the end of this year we'll be moving to a place called Chongli uh, where a, a huge factory of one gigawatt is coming up and we'll be starting a production line there. Yeah, we also, apart from uh, doing the battery manufacturing, we also have our own module designing system. We also do our own BMS and also a complete energy storage system. It's more like a one-stop solution for energy storage solutions. So yeah, uh, that's about the gas technologies. Thank you. Thank you very much. And maybe can I ask uh, the panelists to leave your camera on and just go on mute if, uh, when you're not speaking so that the attendees can see you. Thank you. So let's let's start. I mean, in, if we look at Taiwan, if we look at some of the figures from last year, 2021, um, then we still see a very large reliance for Taiwan on fossil fuels. About 83% of generation share is held by fossil fuels. If we look at solar and wind, we look at roughly only 3% by end of last year. And then if you take the reliance on these fuel imports um, and the current world uh, situation, then we see experts forecasting a substantial jump in wholesale pricing. Um, the, the highest I've seen is 86% uh, jump looking at wholesale pricing of over 200 US dollars per megawatt hour. So, so very substantial. But then if we look forward, what Taiwan is looking to achieve, um, the current peak load contribution by solar and wind is 17%. Um, the aim is to increase that by 2030, so in the next eight years to 74% peak load share or 25% of generation capacity. If we look for, more forward to 2050, then we see solar and wind actually making up the largest share of energy generation with over 50%, and accordingly, the peak load share again being quite substantial. So it's, it's very impressive numbers. Um, and if I listen to, to the deployment of 850 megawatt of solar modules from URE alone, we heard about the 900 megawatt offshore wind under construction. That's 1.7 gigawatt right there, theoretically. Um, but my question would be, and maybe we can ask, uh, we can start with Marina again. Do you actually think these targets that Taiwan has set or that are being forecasted, forecasted are they achievable in the current environment? Well, I, uh, I know these figures seems very uh, aggressive, and uh, I also know that this figure seems um, like what we have right now seems quite far away from these figures. Uh, yet it is really important that these goals are being uh, communicated, communicated with confidence and communicated with hopes. Uh, it is true that in the net zero uh, plan that the government just announced, there are still lots of rooms for clarification, lots of room for further deliberation, and uh, also more concrete step-by-step -step roadmaps should be developed. Yet, um, I would still like to come back to the uh, the importance of communicating such goals. So, so as an offshore wind farm developer ourselves, and also for CIP, we're also developing uh, solar projects worldwide, particularly in the States, and also uh, very enthusiastic in all new technologies, for example, power to X and et cetera, et cetera. So, so, so we naturally, uh, are highly confident and highly optimistic that together with Taiwan, we could together achieve that goal. Thank you very much. Ben, uh, do you have a view on, on these numbers, these targets that we hear and their, their, the likelihood of achieving them? Uh, I agree primarily with uh, what uh, Ms. Marina said. Um, 
I think that uh, Taiwan's goals are very aggressive uh, with, uh, with, with the target, for example, of, of installing 20 gigawatts of solar by 2025. Uh, that's pretty much in three years. And uh, I think the biggest obstacle facing uh, Taiwan in achieving its goal is primarily, I think, uh, two major factors. The first factor being uh, sub subject of available land. Uh, the government needs to, uh, the most common question that, that we ask uh, in the PV industry here in Taiwan is, there is a, a very aggressive goal set in place, but where are the potential sites? Do the, does the, uh, the land uh, as well as the uh, offshore solar, does it match up with the government's plan? The second issue uh, that uh, we, we as manufacturers face is government support. And what I mean by that is uh, Taiwan is famous for being very, very open and democratic. Uh, what does that have to do with uh, uh, a solar? Uh, for example, a solar company can get uh, the uh, privilege or the permit to build a, a PV system in a specific location. However, in Taiwan, if one group, be it environmental, local, or any sort of regulatory uh, group, uh, rejects or uh, has a, a, a different view, that project can easily stall eight months to a year. So uh, to put what I'm saying uh, in a more simplified uh, summary, meaning like, uh, <clears throat> suppose, uh, you know, out of, out of 10 groups, for example, that, that a manufacturer needs to uh, apply a permit for, as long as one group, it doesn't matter how big that group is, if one group uh, vetoes, then the project cannot move forward. Thus, a lot of projects in Taiwan are uh, actually facing mass delays. So I think uh, the solution for this is there needs to be a clear communication uh, a set of clear game rules between the government, local parties, and manufacturers, and a way to be able to, to institute uh, said rules. I think uh, if, if the uh, Taiwanese government and the local manufacturers can reach this agreement, then I definitely think the, the, uh, the role that, uh, uh, sorry, the uh, target that the Taiwanese government has set is achievable. Thank you. And can I just uh, follow up on, on the point you just made? So from your perspective, is there an active dialogue, an open dialogue uh, enabled between the government and the, the industry? Yes. Is there an yes. opportunity, I guess, for developers to be heard? Yes. Yes. Uh, we do have uh, organi <clears throat> organizations as well as uh, a near monthly communication with, uh, with the uh, uh, all, all levels uh, of the Taiwan government, uh, ranging from local all the way up uh, to, 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 to Taipei as well. So the communication is there. Uh, but uh, if we are to achieve the 20 gigawatt by 2025 and the 40 gigawatt by 2035, I personally think that uh, we need to speed it up because 2025 is three years away. We are running out of time. Thank you. Thank you. Marina, allow me one follow-up question because Ben raised the topic of available land um, and, and obstacles in, in deploying solar. Um, how is it on the offshore wind side? I think a lot of our panelists might be interested to hear that. Is it is it fairly straightforward, yes. maybe even easier than an onshore um, wind mm -hmm. or solar deployment? Mm -hmm. Or do you see similar obstacles, issues in the offshore sector? I. Um... I think uh, what Ben raised is, is really, really uh, critical in the solar solar development in Taiwan. And in offshore wind, for example, um, the government has been promoting offshore wind for uh, very, uh, very eagerly for the past uh, 14 years or so. So first of all, there's the demo project, and then there is uh, 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 the so-called first round demo project and second round uh, 
uh, potential sites where the government has mapped out 30 some different sites for the developers to choose and to develop. And now we are entering into the third round. Uh, we call it the zonal development round. And in the zonal development round, the, the developers basically are picking the sites that were left out from the previous round and also choosing sites and creating sites that they uh, deemed good with uh, development potential. So, so far there is still actually quite a lot of uh, projects that are being uh, reviewed by the government for this third round. However, in order to attain the goal of actually up to 50 some gigawatts for offshore wind for the net zero goal, 50 some gigawatt, this, this, this requires uh, what 3000 or more turbines. And that means that certain regulations have to be, have to be lifted in order to allow such installation. Because right now we, uh, uh, we have to go through a very rigorous process of applying more than 15 plus permits to, to actually get that site for our offshore wind farms. And then that with this current round, the round three zonal development, it's an auction round. So each developer can win up to three projects, up to 1.8 gigawatt, this, this number still does not add up to the, the, the hope of a total of 50 gigawatt or more, or 50 or 55 gigawatt of installation of offshore wind. Therefore, regulations must be lifted to enable the build out of offshore wind farm further offshore, even further offshore, extending beyond perhaps 12 nautical miles. So, so actually quite some regulations, uh, regime change uh, needs to happen enable in, in, in order to enable such a large large scale installation. So there is uh, one of the areas that we've been advocating as an industry, as an offshore wind industry, hopefully that, uh, that some change could be seen, but uh, some adjustment on the Renewable Energy Act is definitely needed uh, from the legislative UN level to to actually ensure a fast and massive build out of uh, offshore wind. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for sharing your view. So when, when we hear the numbers of the cap capacity to be added on solar PV on the offshore wind side, but possibly also onshore wind, then one question that also comes to mind is grid. And how does a grid that is used to run uh, mainly on fossil fuels to cope with renewables? And I think Achal and, and Dr. Prem, this is something where we're excited to hear your view as well. So what, from your view, Achal, what role does energy storage play in reaching these targets? And, and how do you see the current market environment? Yeah, no, I, I, I mean, everything said so far is, is right on point. And I, I, I agree, uh, Taiwan probably ranks one of the higher places where a developer has a significant role on stakeholder management. Um, and, and, you know, of course, land is the biggest question, as uh, Ben did mention. But the other side is also connections and connection points and have you got connection approval? Um, and that's where we see storage playing a ma major role, especially in Taiwan. And, and you'll notice many countries where we focus our efforts, we're, we're active in 30 countries. And a lot of the new countries we've entered in the last two years have had a certain topology, which is a long stringy network um, either one coast or the other. So be it Australia or be it, you know, uh, Chile or be it uh, Taiwan, we're seeing as they increase their renewable penetration or their targets, um, you need to add more storage to enable more renewables to be connected fast enough uh, because transmission lines don't get built in years, in one or two years, they take a long time. Um, and as we know, land is a big issue already in Taiwan. So getting right away for transmission is another issue. So hence storage plays a very significant part. If you think about all these uh, issues and say, OK, how do I get wind power from offshore or solar power up and down the country to the large load centers? And that's where storage will play a significant role. Again, ta Taiwan has set targets, very high targets. And, you know, the the, the the beauty of the panel we have here is everyone is is on the same mission 
So I think we're going to be incentivized to say we're going to make it. Um, but uh, obviously there are challenges. Uh, the, the one thing is the beauty about targets is you always have to set them high to even achieve somewhere near them. And so that's the right, I think they've taken the right step. Um, and I, I do appreciate Taiwan as probably one of the only countries in the world outside the U.S., some of the U.S. states that have set a target for storage for even grid services, um, which was really something amazing. Not many places have done that. And I think it's a little lower target. Again, we should set a higher target always. But now, now the next side we're going to see is how much of transmission support can you actually get with storage versus just frequency regulation. Um, so I think there's going to be a major thing. One, one thing I'll highlight is Ireland was running on 100% renewables a few weeks ago. Um, the only reason that happened is because of the significant amount of storage they put on. So for another island grid like Taiwan to achieve even near those levels, storage will have to play a significant role. And you, you, uh, one of the news we obviously all, all read recently was together with your local partner on the 60 megawatt project uh, with, with Thai Power. Maybe in one or two sentences, can you share with the panelists the background of that project? Oh, I mean, this is, this is, uh, it stems back to, I guess, the, unfortunately, one of the last trips I planned before COVID lockdowns happened was Taiwan. Um, but Thai Power had taken a significant step to say, okay, we're going to do 500 megawatts of storage. X megawatts will be service provided. X megawatts would be self-procured. And so Thai Power has done a, you know, a couple of self-procurement projects. This is the largest one that they've done. Um, and, and we've participated in each round because we really see the potential uh, of one storage supporting the grid and two also Thai Power taking an initiative on supporting the frequency. So um, we've been actively pr pursuing the projects that they've been tendering out. And this, uh, fortunately, our partner, our local partner and us have uh, been able to, you know, su be successful on this last tender. And we think that's actually the right step. I, I only think projects get bigger from here. I don't think they, they get smaller. Um, so we're excited that, you know, we get to kind of show our uh, ability to execute first on some something so large. But um, in, in just to give a, a, an idea, we're commissioning, you know, 800 megawatt hour projects around the world. Um, and, and, and many other places, but they didn't get there overnight. They, they did have to make for a smaller project. So this, we think this is the right step by Thai Power. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Dr. Prem, um, for, for gas technology as, as a local manufacturer, um, you talked about your background in storage, also looking a bit of, of solar. How do you, do you echo what you hear from, from the other panelists on the targets in regards to renewables and the support that energy storage will have to play? Certainly, certainly. Everyone uh, came right to the point and they mentioned everything that has to be mentioned. The, the support from the government and the land issues. Yes, of course, the uh, Taiwan always been, I, I mean, Taiwan by itself naturally is a small island by itself and the land constraint is certain there, but there's always a smart solution that Taiwan comes up with all the time for every, every problem. So. I'm sure it's going to come up with the same uh, for this problem as well. And uh, when it comes to about uh, talking about the, reaching the target of 65 gigawatt power, earlier, like around three years ago, when we were just uh, initiating the initiating our factory for one gigawatt, we were thinking, wow, one gigawatt is too huge for a country like Taiwan. What are we going to do? Whom are we going to supply? But then down the line, this year, we started to think one gigawatt is too small. We have, we need the requirements is going to climb up uh, day by day and uh, hour by hour and now we see 65 is easily reachable in the coming in the coming years but of course like uh, how uh, miss Mar marina mentioned or ben pointed out the the issues that are we need the support from the government and the and and how and how everything has to be communicated well from the top to the uh, bottom level made with the organizers or even the local for that matter. And one other point I would like to raise is uh, if if there's a uh, if there's more awareness by uh, awareness that's reached to the public by the government, like as, for example, uh, let's take Gogora as a as a case study here. As of now, or maybe a year ago, people accept Gogora as a, as something that's more of a luxury or more of a comfort ride. They're still not 
away that that's the necessity for the future that's the renewable energy or the or green energy is the future they have not realized this completely yet they still think it's something that that uh, we might want it or something like that so that awareness uh, stepping up is one one other requirement that i think is uh, required uh, to be pushed to the normal public till the government yes okay so awareness creation obviously local engagement being being very important Yes. And I think it's something in general we see as a developer ourselves that the engagement with the community explaining uh, the, the background of renewables, um, probably also debunking some of the myths that are out there about renewables and what they can and cannot do plays, plays a very important role. Um, and I hope that sometimes these kind of events that we're having today will also help a bit to, to bring the message across and to yeah, create awareness. Exactly. Can I just ask you one follow-up question, Dr. Prem, because you're also looking at, at solar systems. What, what role in achieving these big targets does a decentralized solar play for you, in your view? It, it, it's going to be the future, I'm sure, but um, we, we have our own plans for uh, doing this uh, megawatt project where we are, we are installing the uh, few like 40, 50 megawatt uh, storage systems in uh, in localized places. But uh, about, um, it, actually it's something like, I'm not very clear about uh, how to comment on these things because I'm, I'm not from this country <laughs> to talk about the government issues or things like that. I'm really sorry about that. I have my own Okay, no, no, no problem. But maybe I can ask uh, uh, Ben in regards to decentralized solar um, looking at also residential systems, uh, commercial industrial rooftop. What do you see this, or what is the significance in that sector to, to contributing to the targets? Uh, before I answer, can I ask, uh, what do you mean by decentralized solar? Sorry, um, what I'm referring to is basically a um, small scale solar system, be it residential um, or industrial commercial rooftop. So away from, from the more headline grabbing large scale solar deployments. Oh, uh, definitely. I think uh, definitely that right now is the single largest uh, solar mar uh, area that's growing. The government is, uh, is highly supportive of, of this uh, because uh, as mentioned before, Taiwan is, is a small island. So uh, there, there is a lot of talk in the uh, PV industry what will happen after five years if the cover if the government develops at the current uh, rate that, that it's developing we're going to hypothetically run out of land within the next five to seven years what happens to the uh, domestic industry after that uh, this is a topic that was brought up uh, on several different occasions uh, to our government as well as to our uh, panel of uh, manufacturers and uh, apart from this, uh, I know it hasn't been asked yet, but uh, another key uh, component I think is uh, that has been recently brought up is uh, the issue of uh, what the government's vision for domestic manufacturing is. Uh, what I mean by this is uh, we, we have brought up uh, before that any country in the world, regardless of uh, the country's uh, size, population, GDP, et cetera, et cetera, always protects a few key industries. And when I say protect, what I mean is uh, these industries will not be dominated by outside uh, corporations. For example, uh, let me give the audience a few examples. For example, number one is military. Any, any uh, field related to military will be closely guarded. Number two is transportation. Number three is telecommunications. And number four is energy. So that brings us to a topic of how does Thai, uh, I, think, I think one of the biggest issues that uh, we feel as manufacturers is what is the government's vision in the next five to 10 years? Uh, so far the government has uh, drawn a, a picture, a very beautiful picture of, uh, of sustained steady growth, reaching grid parity, reaching net zero, et cetera, et cetera. However, 
with energy. So, for example, let me use the example of uh, CPC, China Petroleum Corporation, the single largest uh, oil, oil and uh, gas in Taiwan. OK, the government has uh, institutions in place to ensure that uh, CPC continues to exist and doesn't uh, go out of business. However, no such uh, implication, uh, no such policy exists for renewables. So one question becomes, uh, does the government support uh, renewable energy domestic manufacturers enough for us to survive for the next 10 years or even 20 years? Because keep in mind, domestic uh, any PV system has a warranty of a minimum of 25 years. So I think uh, the, the most pressing issue facing domestic manufacturers is, okay, uh, the government has spent so much time discussing about, about uh, how much uh, the support the government will, will do from a, from a power generation standpoint, but not enough has been said about the balance between domestic manufacturing versus outside investments. But uh, with regards to uh, residential, yes, residential is extremely important, but to a company like URE, which has a capacity of 2.5 gigawatts, residential is not that big. Uh, you know, like uh, I'll use the example of uh, say, like a, like a country such as Singapore, uh, how many panels can you actually put on a building? For 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 a for a mega a mega size gigawatt a multi gigawatt size company like URE, that's only a very very tiny fraction of our of our annual production uh, uh, per year. So I think that uh, this is a major concern that uh, the government needs to solve. I think within the next uh, year. Otherwise, Taiwanese manufacturers, local manufacturers, will be very hesitant to invest in technology and invest in uh, 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 art and research and development. Okay, thank, thank you for, for sharing your view on that. Um, we, we mentioned briefly local content um, and one of the news that some people might have picked up is the fact that uh, Copenhagen infrastructure will deploy locally made uh, wind turbine blades as early as this year. Um, Marina, can you share a bit more about the background? What, what was the reason to, to opt for these locally produced uh, turbine blades and what, what benefit do you see from relying, I guess, more on the local supply chain? Yes, actually, I'm more than happy to share that it's not just the blades, but also we have cables that are locally made. We have the tower, the cable for the offshore wind turbine locally made. We have the tower locally made. We have uh, uh, the nacelle cover, the hub cover. We have actually more than 10 items uh, in more than 10 components inside of the the turbine locally made and uh, like uh, hendrik just mentioned the first ever locally made offshore wind turbine blade uh, has been successfully produced last and last month early this month and there are several that is now in serial production and uh, these uh, made in Taiwan subcomponents have actually a lot of um, industrial development value. And uh, it all started from the government's uh, localization requirement to projects uh, like our projects, Zhangfang Xidao and Zhongnan projects, uh, where we need to carry more than uh, 27 localization items. Uh, so items including foundation localization, marine construction localization, and all the 14 some localization components in the wind turbines. So so uh, to to maybe I can zoom in to share the 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 industrial development value of a blade locally made. Blade, uh, blade accounts for what close to to twenty ish, twenty five percent ish of the costs of the of the, the turbine, and uh, without blade, there will be no wind power. So blade is undoubtedly 
one of the highest um, value added item and one of the most difficult to make item uh, in the uh, in the turbine together with our supplier vestas we are able to localize the blade in taiwan and the blade to to, to zoom further in the blade that we are producing with uh, with vestas in taiwan in the factory in tianli factory the blade for our turbine uh, is approximately 85 meters long and that is 26 floors high. You know, our office right now sits on the 26th floor. So basically, if we lift the, 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 the blade vertically and have it stand vertically, the tip of the blade actually now will hit this floor, the 26th floor uh, of the building. And uh, this massive uh, achievement is done from scratch, basically from zero. There was no factory built about one and a half years ago. And uh, now the factory is there, is in serial production. And it takes approximately three to 400 colleagues, staffs in the factory to manually produce the blade. So it's a manual labor. It's a craftsmanship work that we're talking about to put into the blade. You have to lay, uh, you have to lay the material layer by layer by hand, and it's it's, it's an impressive setup. And uh, with all that uh, being said, you know the factories right now, the blade production factories right now, uh, is employing more than three is employing more than three hundred colleagues. And these three hundred colleagues, you know, if, they are rather young, they are energetic, they have a vision, they want to dedicate themselves for the, the green transition of Taiwan, and uh, they are basically throwing themselves in producing this brand new technology with their craftsmanship manners and with proper training that they got from Denmark. And uh, so, so that, uh, from, a, from an individual uh, perspective, individual uh, staff, colleagues perspective. This is a highly motivating and highly skilled uh, job task that they are able to embark on. And uh, on a, a local company perspective, Tianli is the local blade manufacturer that exclusively works for Vestas. For Tianli, this is a, such a, a entrepreneurial local company that takes on the challenge and that, uh, that uh, uh, take on further investment because of our, our massive orders to to basically build the factory from scratch. And this is a lot of work that they put in to, to uh, first of all, receive all the specs from Denmark and uh, going into multiple negotiations with Denmark and uh, working with a internationally renowned company from a local company's perspective. So there were lots of... Um, there were lots of uh, cultural, organizational, managerial challenges that they need to overcome to become a properly functioned team. So there on the software and the hardware side, it was a lot of work putting into it. And from a developer's point of view, we will have to constantly support that marriage between Vestas and Tianli to manage that marriage and to also coach and to 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 support them in all ways possible, to coach them and sometimes also monitor them, to make sure that uh, the delivery speed could actually match with the speed of the construction. So, so that uh, had been what we have been doing. And um, looking back, it was a it was a risky but very meaningful decision that we had made. Uh, to actually three years ago to decide to actually increase on the localization quantities for the blade because as per the government's requirement uh, our Zhangfang Xidao wind farm only needed to place the order for 15 blades but we ended up placing more than 140 more blades so this is way much more than the government was asking for. And uh, why did I say it's risky? It was risky because uh, 
there was basically no facility at all and no experience at all in Taiwan. So it was risky for us. It was risky for Vestas. But it was meaningful because of such massive scale of order, it enabled the local company, Tianli, to take on additional financing, to take on you know, additional commitment and uh, investment risks because of this big order to uh, start uh, the construction of the, the, the factory early, actually two and a half years earlier. And therefore, they produced successfully the first blade almost two and a half years earlier than the government had expected. So this is a fantastic yeah. story of uh, public-private partnerships and how we make it work. Thank you. And I guess uh, we, we all agree with, with these targets that we have. Um, the local industry, local partners are playing a very important role. And I think I can speak for Aquila here, but um, deploying and uh, transferring know-how locally is, is very, very important. Um, and maybe Achala can, can ask you here um, in terms of your supply chain, but also the execution of the projects. Do you, do you find what you want to source locally currently in Taiwan, or is there certain things where, where you would say there, there's not sufficient? Maybe is it, it could be uh, people skills, it could be service providers, but it can also be hardware. What is, what is your view as of today? Yeah, no, no, that's a, it's a good topic. Um, and I mean, I'm glad that, you know, offshore winds getting localized. It makes sense. I've seen even certain inverters kind of coming locally. I, I'll, I'll be honest, out of the, the 30 countries we worked in, each and every country has said, please procure everything locally. That's just a normal trend in our industry. Um, no surprises. And that, that's completely acceptable and it makes sense. As Ben said, energy security is always there. You want to prop your own industry up um, for such a critical industry. I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll share a few comments on that. One, one is... The largest chunk of an energy storage system, especially the one we're focused on right now for at least the next decade, is lithium-ion batteries. Um, you, you can get lithium-ion cells probably anywhere in the world at this point because everyone's looking at it. It's a matter of scale, price, standards, uh, which is in question. And then it's also another factor for a, a technology provider like us to qualify these cells and say, yep, we're going to use it and we will support it. Um, because we believe in the cell's integrity and it'll last for 20 years. And so one, one thing we do as an organization we've been doing for, since we started was, I, I think we have our labs, uh, which have tested almost mo most cells in the world at the time, and then we selected two vendors that we use globally. Um, we're trying to increase that to maybe four to five uh, and, and then use those more globally. But one thing we've mentioned is if there's clarity on the scale of energy storage, for example, in a country, meaning in California, someone said three gigawatts, Texas, someone said six gigawatts. Those are numbers that one can play with and say, okay, if there's a local cell provider, it makes sense to just go through contract, qualify a cell pr provider there and make something happen. If there's no certainty in the market um, and, and the scale seems to be wavering around if they're gonna build an extra four LNG terminals or keep a nuclear plant online, it makes it much harder to digest that investment it takes to localize. Um, also, from a cell manufacturing standpoint, you have, as, as, as Prem Chan said, like, you know, hey, we, we can do one gigawatt, which is great, and that's an amazing scale. But really, you, lines to get some scale, you need to have both a mix of stationary storage and EV storage. And the capacities are quite high to get those price points that make sense. So there's a, a delicate balance, Ben, which, which you said is, yeah, you need to protect local industry. Um, but then you also don't want to increase the prices too much by uh, having don't getting not getting the right supply chain or the scale to actually keep the prices competitive. And I think that there's a balancing act that the government must do and evaluate, and then slow, slowly show a path to the you know 60 gigawatt target. How we're going to do X megawatt of each component gives certainty to the supply chain, gives certainty to any technology provider, gives certainty to developers um, to put capital to work. Uh, the final comment I'll say on this. This is basically, if, if, if any certainty is given, it's easier to start mobilizing all the aspects that bring a project together, which is financing. I can see, you know, of course, Aquila is there and developers. Um, if it's supply chain, if it's uh, even the services, and you, you touched on a great point, Hendrik, when you said services, and that's where we thought our first step of localization was more in services and capabilities. And 
Hence, transferring that knowledge to our local partner to do a lot of the work. We provide the product. They'll be bringing the whole system together. Um, and we think that's one of the low-hanging fruits that where we would contribute to a local kind of share of localization. And as more and more components become available, hitting the right price points and the qualifications, I think we fully believe in that, that aspect of localizing. Okay, great, thank you. Dr. Prem, maybe a last, last question also to you. Um, as a local manufacturer, you are starting your full production hopefully later this year. What, what role do foreign partners, foreign suppliers play, play for you? What, what do they bring to the table that you say might not yet be available, um, at least to a sufficient level in Taiwan? Sorry, I think you're mute. Sorry, okay. Uh, to begin with, I would like to point out that our, our uh, more than 80% of our raw materials and things, they are uh, locally supplied. They're all from the local suppliers. And just the, uh, around 15 to 20%, they're from outside where those, uh, they're not in the industrial scale yet in Taiwan. So we had to source them from outside. Apart from that, we are the power cell manufacturers and it's kind of new thing to the world. It's not, not a very old technology. It's been just a 10 or 20 years uh, old right now. So we do need some technical uh, support from outside. And that's what we, we are able to get uh, from outside. Apart from that, everything we are, we are trying to do is uh, more of localization. And I, I would also like to point out that 100% labor force in our company right now and in the future, it's going to be of uh, Taiwan uh, mostly. It's m more like 100%. Yeah, and it's it's just uh, basically the small amount of uh, raw materials that's uh, that's. I, I think in the future they are going to start those even those uh, sm smaller raw materials that's not in not able to acquire right now. But as of now, it's uh, we 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 are trying at least eighty percent from Taiwan uh, local supplies. So it is possible. It is possible to do, and it's pretty good stuff. And the and the, the local labor force that you mentioned was that something readily available, or would you, uh, were you was it necessary for you to provide uh, trainings, um, further knowledge building before you had the staff being able to conduct the work they're doing now? Uh, well, like I said, it's uh, one of the new industries, so we need to provide a bit of training before the start uh, starting of the labor work. Yes, but apart from that, yeah, it's. Uh, yeah, that's all. Okay, thank you. Um, we're coming, unfortunately, already to, to the end of the session. Um, but what I would like to do um, to, to go one more round with our panelists um, to have maybe one sentence um, to, to share if they had one wish that they could uh, let the Taiwan government know that they should fulfill for the renewable energy sector in general or for your specific sector. What would that wish be? Just in one sentence, and, and maybe Marina, we start with you again. We would wish for a more robust, resilient, and intelligent uh, grid architecture for Taiwan's sustainable future development. Okay, great, thank you. Ben? Uh, for my side, uh, my one wish would be uh, clear communication and execution of policy uh, between the, the uh, manufacturers, local parties, as well as the uh, national government. That would be my wish. Okay, so we have grid infrastructure, clear communication. Um, Achal? Yeah, I'm going to be a bit more selfish on the energy storage side. So my, my wish is there's a, a, a great target set. I would say if it was a plan around what was going to make up that target and what the roadmap would be, meaning X amount of transmission, X amount of storage to support the grid, as Marina said, X amount of solar, X amount of wind, it does give a lot more certainty um, because now the RE, saying an RE target can become vague, um, but to really enforce the supply chain and local availability of you know participants breaking that down would be helpful okay so more clear, so clear roadmap and, and, and yeah clear roadmap. clear roadmap Hendrik. yeah 
Dr. Prem? Uh, looks like one, everyone one has covered one thing. Um, I would like to say, again, it's the awareness to the public and also if Paul, see, we're, we're with the with a super increase in the uh, price of raw materials, everything has been, uh, the price of all the, especially the energy storage systems has been increasing. The price is more than 200% in the last two, three years. So it would be better if government can provide more subsidies to the customers from the customer's point of view. Okay. It, it makes our things easier and their things easier as well. So support the deployment through through customer subsidy. Very good. Yes. Okay. Then thank you to all four of you for taking your time today to share some of your insights, some of your views with uh, the other panelists, but of course, mainly with our attendees. Um, thank you also for, for the organizers to give us this opportunity to share some of our views. Um, and I hope everyone enjoyed the session. And Chelsea, I hand it over to you now. Thank you very much, Hendrik, and also our esteemed panelists for an insightful discussion. Um, and next, let us welcome Ms. Carol Chang, show manager from Taichung, who will share with us on Taiwan trade shows, renewable energy trade shows in Taiwan. So, Carol, over to you. Hello, this is Carol from Taitra. Today, I'd like to take this opportunity to elaborate more on the renewable energy industry here in Taiwan, including industrial developments and government policy. Also, I'll give you a brief introduction of all the renewable energy-related trade shows here in Taiwan. So this B2B business platform can assist you in maximizing on the business potential. So whether you wish to enter this market or choose a partner with whom to cooperate in the future, so how's the renewable energy development in Taiwan? Taiwan is a small island with a central mountain range that covers two-thirds of its total land area, and it also lacks the resources to create electricity. According to the Bureau of Energy, Taiwan imported about 97% of its entire energy supply in 2021. So as a result, it is critical to transition away from the reliance on imported fossil fuel and toward energy independence. So Taiwan's renewable energy growth has gone through various stages, with the government making policies based on Taiwan's geographical advantages. So the first is that, according to 4 c Offshore, the Taiwan Strength contains 16 of the world's 20 most suitable wind sites. So offshore wind power in Taiwan has enormous potential. And Taiwan also has high solar irradiance, so which is beneficial for solar power generation. So due to the hot weather, the solar PV power generation peaked at 2.3 gigawatts last summer, surpassing any of Taiwan's nuclear power plants. So it's a great climate for the PV industry to grow, and Taiwan is now the world's second largest manufacturer of the PV cells. So in addition, as tech giants embrace in sustainability, the suppliers must boost their game. So Taiwan is closely uh, linked to the global manufacturing supply chain, and the tech titans such as Google or Apple have joined the RE100 and have promised to use exclusively renewable energy. So their suppliers, such as those in Taiwan, are now required to use green energy during their manufacture. So Taiwan's nuclear power generation should be reduced to 0% by 2025, so with renewable energy replacing it up to 20%. And Taiwan's government has implemented various policy adjustments in order to attain this goal. So the government has set a new um, cumulative install capacity target of 11.25 gigawatts for 2022. So various ministries and agencies will collaborate to take the inventory of the available land or space for the installations of PV systems. So roofs of agriculture, industry and public institutions are among the locations under the considerations. So in terms of the offshore wind energy, the wind farm capacity is expected to reach 5.7 gigawatt by 2025, accounting for 8.4% of the domestic renewable energy. So the total project is estimated to generate $1 trillion in investment and also 20,000 new jobs. So while Taiwan meets its 2025 target on time, we are currently planning for the next 10-year stage till 2035. 
So Taiwan's Ministry of Economy Affairs set a new goal of developing an additional 10 gigawatt of offshore wind capacity between 2026 and 2035. So the energy channel on the plan is projected to strengthen the industrial foundations in the short run. And these measures will encourage energy diversity and self-sufficiency, will boost the domestic demand and job growth, and build a supportive environment for the overall gen uh, energy development. And now I'll talk briefly about the TV supply chain in Taiwan. So from the upstream to downstream of the supply chain, Taiwan's PV industry is split into five primary elements. So previously, the, one of the Taiwan's primary um, competitive advantage was silicon cell manufacturing. And the market share was rapidly grown through the foundry module. So with the rapid expansions of the mainland China solar PV production capacity in the recent year, so the Taiwanese company have transferred and also expanded their business model to include the downstream module assembly. So this shift has resulted in a strong partnership with, uh, between the Taiwanese battery and the module makers, allowing them to quickly expand their business out, uh, operation coverage to the sectors of domestic and also the international system established. Um, projects. And Taiwan is now actively exploring the development of offshore wind power sites with high potential. So the Industrial Development Bureau published the Offshore Wind Power Industrial Relevance Information Program Proposal Guide in um, January 2018. So the goal is to stimulate the establishment of the local procurement market for specific uh, components as well to create market demand for green energy. So the goal is difficult, but with the appropriate quality and competitive principle level, Taiwan can accomplish its strategy um, goal of becoming the Asia offshore wind hub for the Asia Pacific market as for the offshore wind growth sustainability. And Taiwan has several great local suppliers that are working with the uh, other developers now, so more cooperation was expected in the near future. So the entire upstream industry lays on the groundwork for Taiwan to achieve the supply chain localizations and also will lower the development cost. So according to this um, slide, every component of the wind turbine can found locally to complete the project. So now you might wonder, how can we go into Taiwan's renewable energy market? So Taiwan has an outstanding transportation system and buyer will visit Taiwan and easily as, um, access to all the industrial clusters throughout the island by taking the Taiwan High Speed Rail for less than two hours. So many international exhibitions have been thrown by, um, to Taiwan by the island's competent and efficient service personnel. So some major events have previously taken place on the island as well. So every year the foreign um, buyers will visit these trade exhibitions because they give the ideal platform for trading and seeking business prospects. So today I will take this opportunity to discuss four related trade shows that are um, taking place here in Taiwan. So in timely order, the first one we will talk about is the Taiwan International Water Weeks and followed by the Energy Taiwan. And the third will be TAS, the Sustainable Taiwan Expo. And last but not least, the Wind Energy Asia will take place uh, in March of next year. So water is not only necessary for living, but also for manufacturing and industrial use. So many countries are still dealing with water shortage or pollution issues today. So the Taiwan International Water Week, the Taiwan's only water-related professional B2B exhibition, will provide an exceptional and diverse platform for bringing together all the buyers, experts, and participants from the worldwide water industry to present their most innovative water solutions. So reclaim water treatments, green infrastructures, purification equipment, process control technology, and process automations will be among the products on display. So the three-day events will highlight the most recent innovations and explore the business potentials. So um, Taiwan International Water Week will be hosted in Taiwan World Trade Center Hall 1 from October 13th to 15th. So it will highlight the greatest technology for all the industry stakeholders and will focus on innovative water solutions. 
The Energy Taiwan is a comprehensive energy trade expo. It will focus on five energy themes to provide multiple business opportunities, which are PV power, wind energy, smart storage, net zero, and also some alternative power generation methods, such as hydroelectricity and hydrogen energies. So we believe that Energy Taiwan will provide all the industrial players with a better platform for network from manufacturing to service with energy integrations. So Energy Taiwan last year has attracted the most powerful and prominent buyers in the region. So last year Energy Taiwan drew 200 exhibitors with 700 booths to display their products as well over 15,000 visitors looking for business partners. So um, big major players such as TSEC, URE, WPD, CIP, and other important industrial companies will be present at the event as well. So Energy Taiwan this year will be held from 19th to 21st of October at Taipei Nangang Exhibition Center Hall 1. So investing in the circular economy has emerged a major economic trend because Taiwan's critical role in the global supply chains, so the advanced thinking is very important. So aside from the industrial innovation, the secure, uh, the secure economy and sustainable energy, the Taiwanese government has launched the Green Financial Plan 2.0 to assist and lead the local sustainability development. So thus, the Sustainable Taiwan Expo will concentrate on the circular economy and sustainable supply chain. It will help the partnership of the industry, government, and also the academia. So thus, will be hosted at the Kaohsiung Exhibition Center from November 3rd to 5th. So offshore wind energy is increasingly a major issue here in Taiwan, and Wind Energy Asia is Taiwan's premier wind energy exhibition. So it has created the most efficient communication platform for the industry by focusing on Taiwan's wind energy supply chain. So it is the action-packed three days in the hub of a significant industry gl cluster here in Kaohsiung. So with a wide mix of activities during the show, the so Wind Energy Asia will be hosted at Kaohsiung Exhibition Center from March 8th to 10th next year, 2020.